My name is Nikki Crabtree, and I am a 2L at the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney College of Law and a junior staff member with the Utah Law Review. I will serve as the moderator for this panel on 1L curriculum. Before I introduce today's panelists, I want to take a moment to give a special welcome to Herda Teitelbaum, Lee Teitelbaum's widow, who is joining us for this session. Our panelists today are Professor Nantia Ruan, Professor Phyllis Tate, and Professor Danielle Tully. Professor Nantia Ruan, Professor of the Practice of Law, the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, teaches first year lawyering, poverty law, and advanced workplace law. She is the faculty director of the Workplace Law Program and the Homeless Advocacy Policy Project. Professor Ruan writes in the areas of low wage work, class and collective actions, poverty and homelessness, and social justice teaching. Professor Phyllis Tate teaches a combination of federal income tax, wills, trusts and estates, and property-based courses. Her teaching package may also include estate and gift tax and seminar courses with an emphasis on income and wealth inequalities and other social justice issues. She has over 18 years of teaching experience and continues to teach with a passion that brings out excitement and interest to otherwise difficult subjects. Mm -hmm. Professor Danielle Tully joined the Brooklyn Law School faculty in 2021 as an assistant professor of legal writing. She previously taught at Northeastern University School of Law and Suffolk University School of Law. In addition, she was a clinical teaching fellow in the Civil Rights and Constitutional Leg Litigation Clinic at Seton Hall. Her scholarship focuses on assessment, pedagogy, and legal education reform. Her recent article, The Cultural Return, The Case for Teaching Culturally Responsive Lawyering, 16, uh, was selected for the Legal Writing, Reasoning, and Research Section's Newer Scholars Showcase at the 2021 meeting of the American Association of Law Schools. We will have a Q&A session following the presentations. Please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentations. Without further ado, I will now turn the time over to Professor Ruan. Thanks so much, Nikki. And thanks to all at the University of Utah who helped put together this really fantastic symposium. Um, I haven't seen such a great um, number of panels on such an important topic in quite a while, and especially since we're all sort of home and thinking about these things, but not together. To be able to come together and think about them is really wonderful. I also want to thank specifically Professor Leslie Culver, who in a presentation, gosh, many years ago now, really opened my eyes to the duty that law professors have to act on our obligation to those voices in our classroom who are in our classroom that are really too often silenced. So thank you to Professor Culver specifically. Um, Professor Tate, Tully and I are very much interested in this hour being really a conversation. So we plan to keep our remarks relatively short. So we have lots of time for your questions and comments. Um, we're really glad to know that students are participating in this symposium. Um, and so we really hope that um, we're able to have more of a conversation about this important topic in the 1L classroom. I hope to build on the themes we've heard so far, color consciousness over color blindness that Professor Romero so eloquently spoke of, our obligation to build an anti-racist law school from Dean Conway. I'll just very briefly say that um, I'm a first generation American college graduate from both sides of my family. I'm also a child of a Southeast Asian immigrant on my father's side. I teach at Denver Law, where um, our law school really is one of the small handful of law schools that originated the law and society movement from the 1970s. So my teaching has always been framed by how law affects society and how frankly society affects the law, which also informs my belief that addressing how law has racist effects and how law can reform those effects is a duty of every single law school teacher. This duty can be discharged through direct structured discussions with set learning objectives or indirectly through pedagogical choices. While our academic freedom remains, um, our duty to all of our students is, is paramount. In the 1L classroom, intentional dialogues can come from choices of the books that we use, the case law that we analyze, the problems that we choose, the simulations that we and exercises that we bring into the classroom, the speakers that we bring into the classroom, how we set simulated client reveal interactions. I often bring in clients that are Spanish speaking only, that were victims of discrimination, that have been victims of hate crimes. Um, we bring in lesson plans 
Specifically, I know in the legal writing classroom, a, a beloved one has to do with MLK's letter from Birmingham jail. I co-authored a book called The New 1L Year, bringing first year lawyers into the, with client, bringing first year students with clients into the 1L classroom. So what I do is in the spring semester, I bring in nonprofit partners so that my, my, student, my students have real life experience with these nonprofit partners so that their writing and their research goes to a particular impact litigation strategy. So if you'd like to read more about that, um, there are some articles that I can point you to and this book that I helped co-author. So beyond that, I wanna really talk today about the opportunities that come up when unplanned, uh, that are unplanned and are not specific to the structure of the course or the problem design, but what happens when we are really bringing in unplanned discussions, that topics that come up that we need to have race talks in the classroom and how to do that constructively. Because I think that's one of the biggest challenges. At some point, we're going to need to have a conversation about race in the classroom. How do we do that? And I think that we need to do that best first by being prepared. And so I want to focus my time, my very short time that I have, really on um, talking about difficult dialogues on race. And I wanna base my talk on the work of Dr. Daryl Wing Su, who um, I learned about through my work on microaggressions and shout out to Professor Oaks, thanks for shouting me out on the work on microaggressions. That was really great to hear, thank you. Um, Dr. Sue is really well known for sort of um, popularizing our idea of what microaggressions are in the race space. But what his, his ideas are not as well known, and his colleagues at Columbia, I should say too, it's not just him, but his, his colleagues at Columbia. What those ideas that aren't as well known really are about the conspiracy of silence in classrooms. Our social and academic norms dictate that we really not talk about race in the classroom. They help really sort of foster this idea that it's not proper to talk about feelings and emotions around race. And that uh, makes it more difficult to have those conversations. They talk about this politeness protocol, where in the classroom, it's not polite to bring up things that are difficult. The academic protocol, where it's not, um, we talk about logic and reasoning, especially in law schools, but we don't talk about feelings or emotions. And then they also talk about the colorblind protocol, which I think Professor Romero spoke eloquently about um, yesterday. This idea that it the most, so that the highest ideal is for us to have a colorblind society. So we know though that there is obviously harm that comes from ignoring the um, racial impact of our laws and society. And, and really in the classroom, when we suppress these topics, um, the harm that could come to our students. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how we can have these difficult dialogues in the 1L classroom. We know as teachers that the harm that can, that can really occur from doing nothing. So something comes up, a comment is made, an idea is brought up in a case that we're reading, um, something that happens frankly in our neighborhoods that week, that year, in our communities, um, in, our, in our nation. If we do nothing, if we say nothing, that is perpetuating harm. I think we recognize that. We also can't sidetrack the conversation. We can't say, oh, maybe we'll talk about that later if there's time. We shouldn't also appease participants who are maybe are saying something that is offensive to um, particular people in our class or society at large. We can't be neutral. We can't um, validate by appeasing some statements that might be harmful or offensive. We also shouldn't terminate the discussion that's being had or ignore it to hope that it goes away. And I'll say frankly that I think a lot of law school professors hope that these conversations go away because they're challenging, they're difficult. And sometimes people feel like they don't have the tools. So where do we get the tools? I think our panelists are gonna talk a good bit about that today. I'll just get us started by talking about some strategies that I've learned about that I hope to keep emulating, emulating in, in my classroom. First of all, we can't be defensive. We have to educate ourselves and we have to, um, we have to be, we, we can't be ignorant on the topics. So the first strategy I'm gonna talk about is acknowledging emotions and feelings. We as law school professors, we have to take the lead in acknowledging and making sense of intense feelings 
that originate in racial dialogue. It's important to deconstruct emotions. Where's the guilt coming from? Where's the defensiveness? How am I expressing anger? How am I expressing fear or helplessness? What's implicit in the statements that are being made, made in our classroom? There are also nested feelings that until released are roadblocks to racial dialogues. It can make it difficult for participants to listen and understand from one another when we have these roadblocks. So we have to first acknowledge emotions and feelings about these topics. Second, we need to self-disclose personal challenges and fears in the classroom. When we disclose our doubts, our mistakes, our imperfections, we give the students to the, we give a message to our students that it's safe for them to examine their own shortcomings in this classroom. It can free one from the constant guardedness, guardedness that can result from denying one's own bias, denying one's own racism. It allows one to set an example of taking risks and displaying courage. It encourages the discussion for the participants in the classroom to really communicate openly about their feelings and their flaws because they see that their professor is equally flawed. Third, I think we need to actively engage classroom discussions. We can't ignore difficult dialogues or passively allow students to take over the class with ineffective strategies. Difficult dialogues cannot be brewed in silence. That's what Dr. Sue teaches us. Professors have to take control in that moment, but they shouldn't can take control of the content. They need to control the process. So what does that mean? It sometimes that means that we need to intervene with techniques that encourage students to listen, to observe, to reflect, to process, and enlist the help of classmakers to make observations. So from an article called Race Talk and the Conspiracy of Silence, which I'll place in the chat later, um, here's a couple of ground rules that I think are really important for the classroom. We don't put people on the spot. We don't ask people of color to speak for everyone. When we speak, we step forward, but then we step back. We listen to understand, not to react. We give people the benefit of the doubt. It's okay to make mistakes, to make mistakes, to not know something, and to ask questions. How do we control the process and not the content? I think we have to acknowledge one's intention. But as we know with microaggressions, intention really, frankly, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we have to focus on impact. How does what you said impact me? How am I feeling about that? What are the emotions that are coming up? And how am I going to deal with that? Does the response detract or deflect from what's being shared? And if so, how can we get back to the content of, of the discussion and what people are talking about in a way that's not just a responsiveness, reflection, reflective responsiveness, but actually thinking about the impact that's being felt based on what's being said. So this really makes sure that we're creating a safe space for racial dialogues and Professor Culver likes to call them brave spaces. So I'll borrow that for a moment. So I think we need to also talk about the difference between conversations and levels of observation and feedback that are descriptive versus interpretive versus evaluative to try and minimize the defensiveness that can come up when we have these conversations. We need to express appreciation for people who are being brave in that space and support and validation for students to have the courage to speak up. While we also need to be ready to be involved in conversations that are unplanned, it's also important to plan and instigate difficult dialogues to, to help prepare the students for the topic. So I like to, in my 1L classroom, to say we are going to talk about difficult things. These problems are ones that I'm bringing up intentionally, that I plan on controlling this process. I don't plan on controlling the content, and I want everyone to be a participant, but you can feel assured that I'm going to take a leadership role so that way people can feel like this is a safe and brave space that no one, including myself, is immune from making mistakes or blunders, um, especially with regard to race. I'm just gonna end with talking a little bit about um, how to educate ourselves about social and emotional, social and emotional learning, also called ESL, SEL, which is an integral part of professional education. It's really grounded mostly in secondary education, but I think bringing it into the undergraduate and graduate is becoming more and more um, valued. It really applies sort of the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities 
and manage emotions and show empathy for others. And I think law schools is way behind, are way behind the curve on this. So the social and emotional learning that we need to do really sort of requires that we engage in a self-awareness and a self-management, that we have a social awareness, that we pay attention to our relationship skills and there we make responsible choices and decisions. I'll also put in the chat some, some good um, websites that I found on this for teaching tolerance. Um, I like their webinars called Let's Talk. I especially found the one on discussing whiteness where whiteness is seen as a racial identity with the understanding that acknowledges the privilege and power attached to that racial identity. Um, I think that's a necessary step in, when, in our work towards racial justice. So I'll put that in the chat. Um, we talk in our 1L classroom about professional identity quite a bit, but I think we need to talk about the relationships and the self-awareness around sort of our, our skills, our emotional intelligence, um, put that up front a little bit more as well. I'm going to pass it off to my colleagues by um, first, uh, by lastly, quoting Dean Aiken, who I really have read quite a bit and appreciated her work on sort of the overwhelming times. I think that's been also a theme in this symposium is that these are overwhelming times. And so to take on other overwhelming topics can seem overwhelming, I guess, um, and how legal educators can really prepare, student, prepare students to enter an arena where that skill set is required in the, in, the legal, in the sort of legal profession, how to be efficient, effective, resilient. Um, and so she talks about um, the transformative dimensions of adult learning and the fact that there's gonna be disorienting moments in our classrooms, that we can transform those, those race talks, those difficult dialogues into transformative moments in the classroom. So I'll just quote her, I'll end by quoting her to say, it is our jobs as educators to mine that disorienting moment. So I leave you with that and I'll hand it off to Professor Tate. Thank you. All right, good morning. First, I wanna make a clarification because I heard a student say that, um, uh, refer to property and taxes, dry subjects. Those are not dry subjects. Tax is one of the most fun courses you're gonna actually ever take in law school. Um, so just keep that little nugget for those of you who haven't had tax yet. Um, and I wanna echo the thanks and appreciation for inviting me to present in this conference, as well as the opportunity to hear from my colleagues in the field. So my contribution to this important work is to provide strategies to integrate issues of inclusion and race uh, in the first year doctrinal courses. And I'm gonna start with defining a few barriers, um, some of the ones I have not heard already, and then strategies to conquer those barriers and then provide some specific techniques for the courses and strategies to avoid common mistakes. Again, maybe one or two that we haven't already heard. Now, a few barriers to including race and inclusion um, in first year courses is professor discomfort. We did hear about that yesterday. Um, do you also have student resistance, uh, shifting responsibilities? I heard about that this morning um, and institutional resistance, but and, and, and actually, I was going to say I didn't hear this, but I actually did hear this from Professor Dean, uh, the presumption of law neutrality. Uh, having strategies for these barriers is just as important uh, to your success as developing your techniques. Now, the easiest barrier to discuss is shifting responsibility to someone else. Um, there's somebody else already teaching race and law, critical race theory. I don't need to do anything else. Um, the first year is the wrong time. You know, they're new to the law. We don't need to be burdening them with these extra burdens of, you know, introducing race. And my rebuttal to that is um, this is a shared responsibility, as Dean Conway pointed out yesterday. And the first year is actually the perfect time because this is where you'll get a chance to build their critical skills thinking foundation that they can apply to all their other courses. So it's going to make it easier or more accessible as they matriculate through law school. Now, yesterday I heard some information um, that may work about the strategies for professor discomfort and heard a couple of them today as well. Um, and that is, accept the process is gonna be uncomfortable. Uh, most things, most new things are. And, you know, I know dealing with, uh, this, um, with uh, race has a elevated level, level of discomfort and people have anxieties because they're afraid they're gonna say the wrong things. But ex even accept that as part of the process because none of us get it right all the time. I remember my first time, um, I was fairly comfortable with the idea of discussing race, mostly because I thought I had a receptive audience. I was mistaken. 
uh, it went left fast because students were confusing how they feel with what the law does and basing their personal experience with, confusing their personal experiences with facts. And so of course I figured that out fairly quickly. And that day I decided to just pivot the discussion back to the cases so I could have a chance to regroup. So when I came back the next day, I uh, made the announcement, you know, here's what we tried to do, here's what we attempted to do, and here's how we're gonna do it better. And so even though it went left, I still believed that it was an important part of what we needed to be doing. And, and keep in mind, I did this like uh, maybe 18 years ago. Um, so back before it was part of the uh, culture that we're trying to do now. And even back then, I believe that it was an important part of critical thinking. And I had to come up with better ways to facilitate that student discussion so that we could have those constructive conversations. We could have productive analysis and discussions so that it would um, give the benefits that I was trying to do, which was enhance their critical thinking. And I'm gonna share with you in a few minutes some of the strategies that I used uh, to accomplish that. But first I wanna go back to one of the toughest barriers that Professor Dean kind of alluded to this morning, which is the presumption that the law is neutral. Uh, people in general presume the law is neutral, even if because it, it doesn't mention race. Now, um, it's easy to identify those racist laws when, they require, when, when it requires segregation or separate but equal. And it's already hard enough to teach about those laws because people want to believe that we've evolved and the law has evolved. So we don't need to talk about those anymore because we're past that. So it's even more difficult to discuss bias laws when it deals with gender, race, class. I mean, any of them, they're all difficult to talk about because first um, you got to look at the pattern to show the disparate treatment. So you got to you know, wait a while and check a number of years. And then you still have to dig to demonstrate how they're biased because people just generally don't believe it, uh, professors included. Um, Professor Dean again alluded to that when he was talking to the author of that book about including the race of the person uh, in that case. Um, so I'm going to shift now to, to some strategies because one of the things that I find is if you have an ally or somebody who you can collaborate with, that makes it so much easier to uh, do this work. Now, I didn't have one at first, uh, so I had to try to figure things out on my own. It would have been so much better, though, to have somebody have bounce, to bounce ideas off of. And I think it's important because an integral part of the strategy is building your foundation. So get an ally and build your foundation. How do you build your foundation? First, you got to do something that, again, Professor Dean, and I want to keep shouting out my professor, my, my, um, my tax mate here, um, but these were good ideas, uh, is that you have to conduct a critical analysis of your course subjects and your cases. This is why it's good to have a collaborator because you can share some of the workload if you're teaching the same thing. Because next, the third strategy, so, um, uh, get an ally, um, build your foundation. I guess this is not a new strategy. This part of building your foundation is you got to work to integrate instead of supplement this work. Because when you supplement by giving extra credit or making an asynchronous exercise, you lose the benefit of that diversity of thought. And even if you leave time for class discussion and treat it as an extra credit, students take on that message that is optional and it's something different from the law instead of an integral part of the law. So that's why I think you got to do your homework, the professor, do your homework in advance to make sure that it's seamless into the discussion and not something that's just extra that we're going to just throw in. So I think searching for those cases um, that the casebook doesn't give you uh, is a good way to do that. Because when you research and you are deliberate about the content and the sources for the information, and if you keep those discussions based on the facts and the cases, it's a lot easier to steer the conversation uh, because you and, and I think when you give those when you when you do that extra work where you look at the cases, I, I give my students an opportunity to research their, their assignment as well. So I give it to them in advance. It's in the syllabus. So they have notice. Um, I give them some foundational cases to start with and invite them to do their own research so that when we have the discussion or debate, they have their own information, so there's some buy-in, and they can come from a place of knowledge as opposed to a place, a place of feelings. Because I mean, um, we heard about this earlier, but I think trying to navigate feelings is a little bit harder. It's very difficult for me. So I try to keep it steered towards the facts as much as I can, and then we manage our feelings. So, um, but what you're going to run up against 
is that there's a strong preference to believe the law is fair and neutral. So you got to make sure that you pick the right things. And you got to tell your students up front that op-eds and Twitter, they're not sources. You know, Twitter tweets, they're not, they're not sources. They may lead to sources, but they're not in themselves sources. Uh, and building that foundation, it helps with that professor discomfort because I think you feel better about what you're presenting because you have the good background to support it. And it helps with the resistance by students because, uh, I mean, not all students, but when students are uh, able to do their own research and bring in their own knowledge, uh, it helps with that buy-in. And of course, it eliminates the shift in responsibility because now you found your own way and your own voice to contribute to this conversation. So the next strategy I have is that you got to understand there are levels to this. You don't have to do everything all at once. Uh, and you don't have to do something every single class. Uh, and so to demonstrate this, I'm going to point out to, to, to you some of my specific strategies and examples. And my first technique is to develop icebreakers. Now, icebreakers mean the same thing it means in any, any other context, which is introductory conversations. Now, these can be centered on other inequalities that don't necessarily directly impact race. And I think they mostly all impact race. But you can find some that are, are softer on race. For example, um, with um, women's rights or... Um, um, in, in, uh, income or wealth inequality, something like that. Uh, so for example, I'm going to take property since we, you know, we attacked property early. I'm going to show you how property can be relevant to this conversation. All right. So in property, we start with, you know, teaching fundamental property rights, you know, your bundle of sticks. Um, what is property? Who owns property? Who has the right to transfer property? And how possession fits into the property ownership analysis. Now, for those of us uh, who are not teaching property, you've had property and you probably remember the Pearson v. Post, maybe not by name, but by circumstance. Because this was a dispute where you had the person who's chasing the fox and he's in pursuit. And then of course, this other hunter comes along, even though he sees this, he gets to the fox first, he shoots him and takes him. And of course, uh, the first hunter is saying, hey, that was my fox, you saw me pursuing him, you saw me and my dogs and you know that was my fox. And so he sues him. And in that case, um, the court held that the party who had first possession, which was defined as actual possession or occupancy, was the true owner, right? So there's your, your first stack. In, the, in another case, though, it was a Johnson case, which um, had to do with the right to transfer land. And this case centered on who owned the property. And I'm going to read a quote from that case because it's going to help illustrate how I was able to integrate um, the conversation. All right. As a, result of dis as a result of discovery by England, the rights of Native American tribes to complete sovereignty and as independent nations were necessarily diminished. So their rights were necessarily diminished and their power to dispose of soil at their own will to whomever they please was denied by the original fundamental principle that discovery gives exclusive title to those who made it. So, at first glance, you're looking at this and you're saying, OK, well, they're saying, you know, basically whoever conquered the land, they're the ones who um, own it. But when you compare that to Pearson v. Post, which came first in time, they talked about possession and occupation as being the rightful owner of the property. So when it comes to these Native Americans, they changed the game. And so in these cases that demonstrate biases such as this, I make a point of having the students read it out loud in class, one, to make sure that they didn't skim and miss it. But two, when you hear the words out loud, it sounds much worse than it does in your head. And I'm gonna show you a second point um, from that same case that, the, um, that, that was in the court's um, finding. But the tribe of Indians in, inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in possession of their, of their country was to leave the country a wilderness to govern them as distinct people was impossible because they were as brave and as high spirited as they were fierce and ready to repel by arms every attempt on their independence. Are you serious? So by declaring these tribes as unruly savages who are incapable of managing their own country, the country that they occupied, so therefore should have owned, um, we changed that rule from first possession though, that went out the window. Now it's the land of the conqueror. Does that even make sense? So you own your house. If I come in and I conquer you and I take the house, I'm going to jail for theft. 
But that's what we're that's what we're working with. So this gives us a chance to discuss biases and prejudicial beliefs held by judges and how they infiltrate their way, those biases infiltrate their ways into the laws. So when you see outlier cases or cases that has negative descriptions of a party, there's a good chance, now this one was obvious, but there's a good chance for those other cases that race, gender, or ethnicity was a factor in that, in that decision. So as Professor Dean did, well, his wife did, <laughs> you can do the background work and, 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 and demonstrate those in class because there is a good indication that if you have those negative um, 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 references that you're gonna have some level of bias and you're gonna have race, gender, or ethnicity in, in that, um, that, that factors in. So that's one way to implement an icebreaker. You know, later in the semester when we're discussing um, interference with property rights, we have the BP oil case, which is again, more recent. And that case uh, talked about the subsurface rights of property. Now, when we were in law school, we learned that, you know, when you own property, you own it down to the center of the earth, right? But in this case, the owner sued BP for trespass based on the hazardous waste that was entering and invading the subsurface of their property. Now, BP prevailed. Um, but that case is still in the book and it doesn't mention race and it doesn't mention class. But to me, that was an opportunity to look at who the plaintiffs were, where these oil and hazardous plants are often located because the, um, the location of these plants and the discussion about that, that wasn't included in the case. So this is one of the things where I give an, an assignment to review or research these questions. And I provided an opportunity for them to do their own additional research because they all noticed that we're gonna discuss this in class because research shows that people who live near oil uh, drilling sites are exposed to or exposed to some kind of harmful pollution, they're at greater risk of uh, preterm uh, birth, uh, birth defects, asthma, respiratory disease, cancer, a, a whole host of other health concerns. And so that gives us a chance to, again, talk about where these plants are located and who are directly implicated by these particular dangers and the danger of having a precedent such as this. Now, even though these implicate race directly, I focus on the class and the gender, because at least in this case, we had three women who were bringing the, bringing the case and they were in a uh, relatively low um, income neighborhood. And I focus on class here intentionally because even though race is implicated, because the housing values are easy to demonstrate you know, the um, income level, uh, there's little resistance to, to that discussion. Because remember, my strategy is layering. And so every week, I'm planting seeds to open their minds to this critical thing about the laws and how we perceive the laws. And so, and, and the deference that we give the laws, how we shouldn't give so much deference to the laws. So some point in the semester, I get students who start sending me articles about current events that, that implicate these things that we're talking about in class. And so now I know we're on the right track. Later on in the semester, we talk about Married Women's Property Act and the evolution of women's rights and their right to transfer property. So at this point, we've discussed this bias laws against Native Americans, women, and class issues. So because we've been shaping this over the course of the semester, and we've been building the layers and the foundations, it's time for those race discussions. And to me, I think they're primed for it then. So because race is implicated from day one, we can really relate back to some of those cases and integrate those discussions into what we're doing now. And again, to manage those conversations, I encourage, I, I, um, encourage open, but I want structured conversations because people are gonna bring in their own misperceptions and their flawed arguments. And so I try to again, steer them back to the facts and what we can show and what this law did in that particular case. So if, for example, um, when we talk about mortgages, we discuss the impact mortgages have on your ability to purchase. Uh, more recently, we've seen some of the people live through the subprime lending debacle. Um, we discussed the impact it had on home ownership rates and housing stability, and we, we discussed the statistics on who was really impacted by those loans based on race and now house and household income. Now, because we've integrated this information all along, when we get to discussion of redlining and discriminatory covenants and zoning and eminent domain, these discussions are already ripe for the race discussions. And so to me, even though they're ripe, you still have to be deliberate about the delivery. You can't just assume that it's just gonna come naturally, which is why I lay that foundation from really day one. So these are some snippets of some examples and ways in which you can integrate into the coursework. Now I'm gonna conclude in my discussion with uh, two strategies, I think, to avoid some common mistakes. 
And one is to avoid, you know, just the dump. I implied this earlier, but resist the urge to just unload a bunch of information on the students and expect them to navigate this on their own or expect them to just get it in the, um, the um, other courses like race and law or critical thinking, critical skill, critical race theory, because not all students are required to take those courses. And that puts an undue burden on those particular professors when I'm showing you strategies in which ways we can integrate those even in the first year. Now, the other side, the other um, um, strategy I have is on the other side of that imposter syndrome. Because if you're a professor of color, you just need to be prepared for the hostility, the microaggressions or the negative behavior that's gonna come from that and have your own strategies to deal with that. Um, we heard earlier um, um, about that imposter syndrome, but I think the other thing, the other dynamic to deal with is that black professors are generally presumed incompetent and perceived as angry. As such, your response when you're dealing with these matters has to be measured, but still responsive to the situation. And so have your strategy for how you wanna deal with that. Um, for our white allies, be prepared as well, because some of my friends, you know, they were all women, so that may have something to do with it, but they reported that they met with hostility as well. So one of my go-to ways to deal with that is uh, let's discuss what your premise is and give me the source for your information. And most of the time when they're operating from feelings, um, and I'm trying to steer it back to the facts, uh, if they don't have the source at that point, I give them an the opportunity to bring it back at the next class and we can discuss it then. And so um, I'm not cutting you off. I'm not stopping you, but let's make sure that we're operating from the same information. So bring us, you know, the source of your information so that we can read it too. Um, and we can discuss it in, in, in a manner that's constructive. But because I require sources from day one, this isn't perceived as something that's unexpected or feel like it's a punishment because in every single one of my classes, I always go to, let's cite the law. What does the law say? What does the case say? What are the facts of the case? So to, to get through uh, those conversations. So in the end, I think the goal is not to convert people or change their minds. It's to open their minds. And that's the approach I take. And I think that's, the, that's where I'm going to end uh, this part of the discussion. I certainly thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Tully. Uh, thank you so much, um, Professor Tate. Uh, and, and like my like my co-panelists, I want to thank the Utah Law Review for hosting this symposium and for inviting me to participate uh, in what surely feels after two days and maybe even after this whole year, um, like a growing movement for some profound institutional and systemic change. Uh, I also want to thank Professor Leslie Culvert, who I met in my first year of teaching legal writing and who has been a mentor, friend, and co-conspirator uh, along the way for me. So I want to thank her specifically for the work that she has done um, uh, behind the scenes for this symposium as well. I want to pull back for um, a moment from the granular focus of my co-panelists, uh, the master class um, from Nantia Ruan in social emotional learning and um, the, the fascinating uh, 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 groundwork that Professor Tate does in teeing up discussions of race um, over the course of, of her class. And to think about how we might approach um, some of this work, not as individual professors, but more structurally uh, throughout the 1L year. So for the past five years, I've been simultaneously troubled and intrigued um, by this, the symposium's core question about how can I or how can we build a more inclusive curriculum? Uh, I vacillate at times between being filled with energy and ideas and then being utterly drained from hurtling over the profound structural obstacles that seem to rise up um, never endingly uh, to stall and thwart uh, pro progress. When I returned to teaching over five years ago and started teaching legal writing, I was excited about the ABA and the new process of adopting the revised standards 301 and 302, which as you know, require law schools to adopt, um, to evaluate their curricula, their instructional methods, to adopt and publish learning outcomes for law students, and then to assess whether in fact their law students are meeting those uh, minimum knowledge, skills, and values that the law schools have identified. Um, this felt to me as, a, as someone interested in, in legal education reform and pedagogy um, as an exciting time. Um, these revised standards opened the door for change. Committees convened, they studied, they reported, they tinkered, and then by and large, uh, I would argue much remained exactly the same. 
So I went back to my syllabi, to my classroom, to my students, um, to my scholarship, uh, to my teacher, scholar, mentors, and colleagues um, to problematize and try to make sense of the frustration that I was feeling over um, uh, work, what it meant to work for change without making um, any progress for our students. And then in the last um, year and a half or so, there was this profound combination of polarizing political climate, state sanctioned violence, and the COVID pandemic, and they collided in this new way. And I think more than any other constituency, our students said to us, enough. They just said enough. Uh, and it seems that maybe, maybe we're ready to listen, and not just the faculty who have always been listening. And I'm speaking particularly about the black and brown faculty members uh, uh, who have borne the deeply discounted and even entirely uncompensated weight of anti-racism work um, at our institutions for decades. Coalitions within and across law schools um, and across statuses within those law schools uh, are starting to form. And that is truly exciting. So despite the gravity of what got us to this moment, um, I'm feeling cautiously optimistic uh, because we're beginning to move beyond efforts again by individual professors. Um, as we heard from Professor Tate, she's been doing this for 18 years, but I didn't take Professor Tate's class um, and many of us didn't. So we need to have this um, change uh, be bigger and, and wider. Uh, I was listening to a presentation by Casey Park this week at BU as part of the uh, Barbara Jordan speaker series, and she suggested that we might be at a new threshold of an old fight. My co-panelists and other presenters today and yesterday have also echoed the sentiment that we're at a crossroads. So I want to pause and think about um, what that crossroads means for the 1L year to take stock of where we are. Uh, and I'll be honest, I think actually where we are still is pretty stark. Uh, law schools are perpetuating and even building new forms of inequality year in and year out, while fostering profoundly unhealthy lawyering practices, as evidenced by the studies on burnout, depression, substance abuse, some of which uh, Professor uh, Deo spoke about in her keynote this morning. And to borrow a phrase from Professor Alexa Chu, another co-conspirator uh, and, and um, mentor, law schools are themselves incubators of inequality. And so without concerted efforts then to reimagine legal education, particularly this pivotal first year across and between uh, classes, our law schools are going to continue to function as incubators of inequality. Um, and we know this, um, we have known this for a very long time. There's, there, there are tomes written about this. The ideas you've heard today uh, and yesterday, while profoundly important are not new. Um, after decades of critique and various reform efforts, the traditional law school curriculum, as I mentioned, remains largely unchanged. Uh, and being unchanged, um, law schools continue to replicate white dominant social culture and re reinforce false narratives that the law and the study of it is neutral. That's not to say there haven't been changes. And again, we've heard about many of them today. There are a growing number of first year podium professors who integrate critical perspectives uh, like Professor Tate and Professor Ruan into their first year cor courses. We heard from uh, Professor Stephen Dean, my colleague about his work in tax. And a few law schools have newly adopted anti-racist curricula. We've he heard from uh, about the, the AALS Law Dean's anti-racist clearinghouse project, new efforts to create casebooks and supplements today by Professor Hannah uh, Brenner Johnson. We heard yesterday from LSAC's diversity chief officer, Angela Winfield, about LSAC's work in pre the pre-law school pipeline programs. Dean Conway spoke at length about Penn State Dickerson's program, um, along with a very new and exciting book series on building an anti-racist law school. Um, and again, powerful um, data-driven studies from Lessi, led by Professor uh, Mira Deo. And yet, with all of that, our first year courses are still taught predominantly um, from edited appellate, appellate decisions that often gloss over human context uh, and entrenched power structures. Of the, the textbooks, again, as we've heard, have been tweaked, they've been edited, new cases and concepts appear, others are erased, new and, uh, and more diverse voices are being included, and all of this is important, but by and large, the casebook method remains paramount. Um, even in my own discipline, legal writing, students focus on form, like mastering predictive analysis, rather than spending time on context. Um, and while some legal writing professors have embraced concepts such as cultural sensibility and social cognition, social emotional learning, as Professor Ruan um, discussed, the discipline as whole still has not. Um, few legal writing textbooks discuss how social cognition and culture impact the law's creation, how it's interpreted or how it's implemented, and none address race or structural oppression in any way. 
This omission, whether it's in our podium classes or in writing classes, tells our students what's important and what's not. So through this prism, they are learning early and often, um, many from their first day, that much of their own lived experiences outside the classroom walls is only meant for the margins, if it's meant for the law school at all. Um, and I want to talk about another potent factor in the reform equation when we think about the first year. It's the very power structures that animate our institutions. So if I suggest, um, as I do as, to anyone who will listen to me, um, that we must remake our first year um, and perhaps all three years, um, such a project is going to require a real power shift in our institutions. And those institutions have been loath to add seats to their decision making tables. It's going to take courage, um, and I and I actually disagree with with uh, with Professor Sarah Oakes that it does. It's not. I, I think it's going to take seeding space. It's a profound reapportionment. Everything from credit hours and assessments to hiring and admission targets. Um, ultimately, we're going to have to question and disrupt the processes and structures again, from our core sequences to our faculty hierarchies, um, and and uh, think about how they continue to reproduce inequality in the legal academy, uh, in law practice, in the law. Um, and no negotiating this reapportionment, however, is a little bit like trying to shift power in a gerrymandered map. So again, as Professor Sarah Oaks noticed, noted, uh, uh, we have a law school caste system that negatively impacts um, institutional change. And because it impacts institutional change, it negatively impacts our students. So first year courses, as she noted, are taught by a mix of faculty, some who have job security after a long road to tenure, others who hope to have it and who may alter their teaching and lower their institutional heads on, on the road to that vote. And then there are those who have no status, no vote. Uh, we have influence only in our proximity to power. And in many institutions, those faculty with the least institutional power, again, legal writing faculty, academic support, research librarians, um, and in some places, uh, clinicians as well, they have the most one-on-one -on -one instructional and mentoring contact with our first-year students. They know the most about the skills and experiences the students bring to their law school study. They provide detailed, individualized feedback and support. They have ideas about what should be done, and yet most have little or no power to make any of those changes. Uh, as as um, uh, inspira uh, inspirational scholar and thinker, the late Robert Cover wrote in Violence in the Word, he said, it's one thing to understand what ought to be done and quite another thing to do it. Doing it entails an act of will and may require courage and perseverance. Uh, so what then is, is my solution? I've told you all the problems, we know that they exist. Um, so I think that if the first year curriculum socializes future lawyers and shapes the law and the profession and legal institutions, then we have to remake it. We have to remake the pivotal first year and provide students with opportunities to develop the mindsets and skills that are essential, not only for competent law practice, but also to advance equity and justice. So to start the project though, uh, to move towards action-oriented change that builds uh, an inclusive and equitable law school for all its constituents, um, students and faculty and staff alike. The first question for me isn't what are we willing to add? Um, often those are trainings, book groups, committees, courses, but actually what are we willing to give up? But to answer that question about what we're willing to give up, first we have to grapple with another series of questions. Who is actually at our decision-making table? What and who is being privileged in our law school structures and in our classrooms? What and who is being sidelined? What and who is being overlooked? What and who is being erased? Much like the clinical and experiential movement to rebuild the pivotal first year, we have to interrogate what skills and valid skills, values, and knowledge future lawyers need, not only what they need to pass the bar or to signal to employers where they fall in our class rank, but what they need to thrive in and contribute to a more healthy and equitable and just profession. Uh, in an article I published last year, I proposed a place to start, and that I suggested that schools adopt culturally responsive lawyering as a framework for their legal education. The goal then is to move beyond individual professors, but to adopt some instructional touchstones and learning outcomes that are integrated across the 1L learning year and beyond so that students experience their learning as an integrated piece of a whole rather as, than as distinct containers. So with that, I propose three tenets. The first is that culturally responsive lawyering accepts uh, as, a, as a starting place that culture and law exist in a mutually constitutive relationship. 
As a legal writing professor, I teach my students to funnel their rules from the broadest statement uh, to the most specific, but we seem to shy away from this first principle in many of our classrooms. We jump into the law without situating it as a rhetorical endeavor, um, but law is the primary, or language rather, is the primary method through which humans communicate, and it both reflects and creates our reality. Law is a dialogue about power, as we heard uh, Professor Tate talk about in the struggle between first in time versus possession. As a result, uh, in the first year, we have to take a, back, a, step, a step back from some of the language of property towards civ pro, crim law, et cetera, and talk about law's role in meaning making. And to use a literary concept, we have to talk about law's role as world building. And then at the same time, talk about how, and, and consciously teach our students how culture both produce, it produces and shifts um, that meaning making process. Second, after we take that first principle, culturally responsive lawyering also requires that we as law professors, law students and lawyers you, utilize transformative legal analysis, analysis in our work. And that's a type of legal analysis uh, that not only asks what does the black letter law say, but evaluates how cultural, culture, context, and cognition impact what the law is, and also asks what should the law be. So this change requires us to slow down um, and to spiral some of the critical contexts and skills throughout a student's legal education. Uh, it's impossible to get through 100 pages of a torts textbook in a single class and grapple with the backstories, rhetorical moves, and power allocation that's present in the law. We cannot do it. We cannot expect our students to do it. Uh, third, culturally responsive lawyering employs transformative legal analysis along with intercultural sensibility when operating in any role in the profession. Core to intercultural sensibility is self-knowledge and professional identity formation. Some of those core skills about social and emotional learning that Professor Ruan was speaking about. For our students, our faculty, law schools, um, they shouldn't feel like a shattering when we enter them. Instead, our institutions and legal education more generally should specifically help not only its faculty and staff, but also its students to connect their pre-law and outside of law selves to their law selves. Uh, without doing so, law schools will remain profoundly segregated and alienating spaces. So a, a reimagined first year would meet our students where they are now, um, not where they were and who they were 100 years ago. Um, as we've seen, change is glacial, um, but merely tinkering around the edges is not only insufficient, but perhaps it's actually detrimental because with each new tinker, new constituencies coalesce around new statuses and a new status quo, making further pro progress all the more challenging. Um, so instead, legal education should create learning experience that, that cultivate constructive discomfort. Going back to that um, idea from uh, Professor Nuon in her quote, um, I propose modular, multidimensional spiraled pathways across the three years based in service learning and problem solving model. And that's because human beings learn by doing. We iterate, we reflect, we calibrate, and that's what we should be doing in law school. Ultimately, we have to stop creating and recreating destabilizing and destructive, destructive discomfort, which is faced by many of our students and felt most profoundly and most harmfully by our students from marginalized backgrounds. Law schools weren't designed for our present moment. They weren't designed um, at all for this moment. Um, but, but I do think that we can meet the challenge um, if we're asked, if we have the courage first to ask, uh, what am I willing to give up? Uh, and with that, I'll stop and, and hope that we can have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. These were all incredibly invigorating conversations and I'm really excited to hop into the Q&A. So let's go ahead and get going. So. The first question goes to Professor Tully's presentation, and it asks, how can students help? Because it seems like by the time that we all start our 1L classes, it's almost too late. And this is especially true for first generation students who have a tendency to be part of those marginalized community. And everything is just coming at students in the 1L year so quickly that it's hard to know if something is not right and how to challenge it. Um, absolutely. And, and I actually think that that um, going back to, to Stephen Dean's com comment and, and Sarah Oaks about um, our caste system, I do think that it's actually first and foremost the responsibility of, of all professors to take stock of the damage and the harm that we're creating, particularly for our first generation students and, and, um, and really be very, very conscious in revealing um, the hidden curricula that exist in law schools. Um, and calling it hidden curricula and, and, 
and being very specific about um, we have gotten to this place because there's been uh, an unequal access to information, unequal access um, to networks, unequal access um, to, to even the, the, the sense of, I mean, when I think about the students who come to, who come to and demand office hours and demand various things versus students who sit on the sidelines and wait till the very end of the year, um, embarrassed because, because they're afraid that even their question somehow um, masks that, they're, that they don't belong. Um, I think we as professors have to acknowledge that that's real. And from, from, the, from day one, begin to break down those barriers for our students. Um, so that we can create a new environment for, for our 1Ls. Um, additionally, I think that that orientation needs to be about um, equalizing some of the, some of that um, playing field. Um, the, these sort of boot camps to 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 bar prep and bar passage. Um, I think we have to, to rethink that that bar passage, while essential, because it's a part of a credential, uh, it's our credentializing process um, for for law school is the floor. It's a minimum floor for um, being able to practice on one's own. It's not our aspirations, not for our, for our students, um, and not for, and not for ourselves. And so, um, begin to change the the message about um, access support. Um, and I'll also say um, to the point about structures. Um, I think that academic success across institutions um, needs uh, robust investment. Um, that students uh, are students who are entering our law schools are coming from decades of uh, K to twelve education uh, where no child left behind radically changed the types of in in ed education that students were getting in um, K to twelve uh, public schools. Um, that is not their fault. Um, and and uh, there's some remedying work that we need to do on the education side, and this goes back to, um, we need to meet our students where they are, not where they were 100 years ago. Um, they learn differently, they think differently, they're multimodal, um, they are, uh, they are um, keyed into technology in a way that we aren't. I think that we, we need to rethink the way that we're interacting um, and preparing our students for law. That is great. Thank you so much for that answer. And I completely can empathize with everything that you're saying. Um, so the next question has to do a little bit more with the implicit bias that everybody has been speaking about. Uh, so the resistance within law to recognize its own implicit bias is incredibly frustrating. So how can law students engage with the administration and faculty to be able to constructively have this dialogue from a change management perspective? Well, I know it'd be incredibly helpful to me uh, when the law students come to class and we're discussing these matters to come prepared to actually have the discussion and not leave it up to me to lead or the two to three other students to just have the whole conversation. So for me, the more engagement that we have to help us unpack and understand that I think it's gonna be more accessible to the students to then go out and apply it in other aspects, whether it be, to demand more courses, demand more professors engage, or when you're out there and you have clients who, because you don't get to control who comes into your office and understand the, dynamic, the dynamics of how implicit bias works in the law will help you better represent your clients. So I think it's important work. I think it's important for the students. I think it's important for them to engage. Um, and I definitely encourage it at, at every level. Nikki, something that was said at the last panel, I think, speaks to this as well, which is that, you know, I'm maybe because I come from a labor worker rights perspective, but I think students ha do have a bit more power than they think they do to speak to administration from that sort of management viewpoint, right? They are um, consumers in some ways, right? And so to actually flex that consumer power to go to the administration and say, this is what we want, this is what we need, point to, you know, Professor Tully's work to say, this is what lawyers, when they graduate, have to be culturally competent in this way. And so this is what the law school needs to do to help me prepare for that legal profession. And so what I need to see in the classrooms are X, Y, and Z. And I think the people that should be, um, you know, sort of given um, equal status and all of that should be the people that I'm learning this from. And, and, and it should be just not in this one place, but across the curriculum. And so I, I think that I hate to put the onus on the students, <laughs> but I do think there is a, 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 I would be amiss if I didn't say that I think that students can take the reins a little bit here to go to the deans and the administration to say, this is what we're, this is, this is what our demands are. Unionize. <laughs> 
That's really fantastic. And I think that that kind of speaks to a lot of the questions that are coming in that really have to do a little bit with that power imbalance that exists not only between students and professors, but between students and administrators as well, especially in law school where the curve of a or a professor's future letter of reference are critical to applying to clerkships, on-campus interviews, future jobs. So how can professors help students feel safe to engage in these dialogues, especially people who, uh, as law students, have may, may have never encountered needing to have this conversation before, who have never felt safe to have that kind of conversation before? So, I th so it, you know, that, that's a, ch a challenging question, uh, in part because I think that, you know, this is one of the things that Professor Oakes brought up, and it's been um, brought up um, in other panels as well. Uh, but the but, but some of the, the navigating work um, uh, falls disproportionately and in an uncompensated um, way to uh, particularly faculty of color and female faculty um, and often to skills faculty. And so um, I, I think that we, we are trying to do that all the time. And yet part of the challenge is also that that work is not valued in, in, um, in for example, in our uh, uh, our status and retention um, offers and our annual reports. Um, and so, you know, I think thinking strategically about how we can have some synergies about what's actually best for students and best for the profession. Um, and that uh, then requires um, sometimes actually going, um, and, and this is again, I, challenging, I think, because as Professor um, uh, Ruan noted, we, you know, we're putting some of this on the students, but actually um, engaging professors who they might not um, uh, necessarily or naturally engage with around some of these topics, demanding it across the curriculum and across the three years, um, uh, going into dean's offices, going to diversity directors, um, and and talking about um, the what they what what they desire and what they deserve out of um, what is ultimately a very expensive three years um, and as part of uh, is shaping uh, and supporting the, the the roles that they want for themselves in their future careers and so um, it is the budding adv advocacy work and yet I recognize that that work also with students often falls again disproportionately on students who are uh, come from marginalized backgrounds and so while they're trying to uh, do their case briefing study for class out outline prep, they're also taking on the work of trying to make law schools and legal education better for all of the, us. And that that burden is too is too heavy to bear. Um, so it it's um, there, I, do, I do think there's no easy answer. And some of the answers do need to come from that top, what is currently the top tier of the, um, the CAS system, which are deans and, and tenured professors. And I think the other things that students can do is be aware that those students who don't want to have these conversations, they're, they're, they're getting their voices heard. They're writing those letters to the deans and to the professors saying how unhappy they are with um, having to use up class time for these kind of discussions. And so you got to have the other students who are happy with or at least satisfied with the um, with the discussions to also speak up because you're unaware that they're doing this work. And we can't come and tell you and ask you to write those because one, we don't know who you are, but two, it's going to look solicited. And so it will be discounted and disingenuous. So when you do have somebody who's putting in the work and doing that hard work to help you expand your mind and open your mind, I think it, it is helpful to the professors to acknowledge that and put that in writing and send that to the administration. I would echo that. That is incredibly important. I think um, elevating the people, at this is students elevating professors and other faculty. It, it is uh, us as, as faculty elevating one another, both within our institutions and across institutions. Those letters of support and appreciation um, do go to our service. It goes to our credibility, um, not only uh, in the legal profession, um, but also as, as professors. Uh, and, and some of that's necessary to, to counter the very real flack that we are getting from call, for, for calling for reform. Those are both really great points. I think it's it very much speaks to the notion that you know the only person that you're going to hear in the room is the person who's dissatisfied, and that there needs to be something there to counter that. Um, Professor Tully, I noticed that you said that a lot of this work does fall to the legal skills faculty. Why do you think that is, as opposed to falling to the doctrinal faculty? I think some of it is just the structure of uh, the legal skills curriculum. So we are fortunate to have um, small class sizes uh, and to um, and to 
for many of us have uh, teach our students for an entire year. And, and although I will say that I, you know, I currently have 41 fantastic law students, it is, it is very challenging. 41 is a, is a heavy load um, to, to do individualized um, support and mentoring um, across, across a year. And so um, I think that, uh, our students from, you know, my students for the very, from the very first week of class are handing in assignments to me that they're getting um, individualized feedback on. And I'm, and they're in my office for conferencing in the first week of law school. Um, I require conferences in part because um, I was one of those students uh, as a first generation um, lawyer uh, and second, uh, second gen to go to college um, who didn't go to office hours because I, I didn't even know how to utilize that. And so um, I would have benefited from someone telling me you have to show up because so much good stuff happens in office hours. Um, so much stuff, good stuff about what you're learning in class, but so much good mentoring about what happens for the rest of your the rest of your life. So I think it falls on us because we're opening the doors and because students um, are just naturally uh, crave the um, that sort of individualized um, learning and teaching. So again, without changing the structure, we're going to continue to do um, continue to do the work. I'll add to that to say, uh, Professor Tate notwithstanding, I think other 1L teachers um, don't take teaching as, as, as seriously as skills professors do in terms of innovating their class. They rely on the casebook method. They rely on the, the class I've been teaching for so long. Professor Tate, you are not one of those, but I think there are too many that are, right, frankly. And it's, this, it's the professors that are teaching lawyering skills and clinics that really are um, innovating all the time around pedagogy. Um, and I think partly that might have to do with um, sort of the uh, what is rewarded in law schools. So for a lot of lawyering skills faculty, they're rewarded for great student evaluations and their teaching evaluations, whereas um, non-lawyering skills faculty are rewarded on their scholarship more often than not. So they spend their time writing the books and writing the articles and not maybe on the teaching as much. Now that's an oversimplification and I'm certainly not gonna say that's true across the board, but I think that's partially why you see, you know, we're the ones who are really doing a lot of simulations. We're doing a lot of real life um, clients. We're doing all of that in the 1L and 2L, 3L years and maybe not as much in the other classes. And so we got the opportunities to have these conversations, these difficult dialogues and classes and these relationships with students where we're bringing in real, real problems, real issues, real clients, and then students then feel comfortable talking about well, what does this mean for other groups, other identities, other issues? And so it more naturally fits into those conversations. That's also my hyp hypothesis on, the, on that as well. That's fantastic. And I completely understand and agree with that. My legal methods and writing professor was the professor that I was the closest to for exactly the reasons that both of you have mentioned, that all three of you have mentioned really she was the most approachable and the easiest to be able to talk to because there were required meetings and because I finally understood why it was important because I was also a first generation law student. Uh, so kind of pulling back a little bit and looking at what kinds of fundamental change everybody recommends, how, what kinds of fundamental changes would you like to see uh, to incorporate all of these fantastic ideas that have been put forth today into law schools? Is it trainings for faculty? Is it a requirement for professors to show engagement with race issues or something else? Uh, I'll start off. Um, I think one of the things that I, I think is essential that we that to grapple with is the curve. Um, I think that it doesn't serve our students. Um, it it uh, Our grading policies and assessments don't track um, lawyering skills um, in, in the majority of classes, particularly in the first year, and they're causing um, toxic stress and creating um, uh, real barriers to building um, a, a kind and, and, and um, equitable profession. Um, and I think that we've been relying on it for too long, um, creating um, hyper, uh, hyper difficult final exams that, that force a natural curve, um, perpetuating the, 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 um, the, the feeling of insecurity and, and uh, of being an imposter in many of the students that we're trying to support. And I think that there's just really no, um, there's no um, valuable basis for that type of assessment um, to the extent that we think that first year um, grades correlate with bar passage and that's a useful um, inf that's useful information for us um, to glean to, to, to figure out um, where and who and needs additional support. Um, in fact, there are um, pre-bar um, pre-bar 
bar assessments that are specific to the bar itself that could be used. Uh, and we could move towards um, a standards-based assessment where we actually let students know where they are on a level of competency. And rather than um, penalizing students that we that we bubble wrap them in support and scaffolding um, that support them in their in their um, in their ongoing journey to be lawyers. I think one of the things that we can do and should do is integrate um, a statement or um, um, requirement that professors who are going up for tenure or their post tenure review has to uh, demonstrate how they have contributed to this work. And I think that if that was a standard for tenure, and I'm just speaking to the doctrinal because I'm, I'm in that realm, um, and they're the ones who typically are, I don't want to change my syllabus. I've been doing it this way for X number of years and I don't want to change anything. If you put it in that post tenure review, or you put it in that um, tenure requirement or any salary, any uh, research or bonuses that you, you get for writing or going to conferences, you, you, you hit them there. Then I think that's going to provide that incentive to actually get engaged in this work, because right now there are no repercussions to to not doing it. So the ones of us who are doing it are taking on the yeoman's work because I do this in every single one of my courses, not just property in tax and in wills. Of course, they're they're interrelated. So that's that's helpful to me. But I don't get the same students that I taught for property in my other classes. So that means I got to still some, do some groundwork because the other professors didn't. So this is the time where I start thinking back. So this is recorded. And is this going to come? Is this going to come back to me? Because let me tell you, Professor Tate, speaking truth here, post tenure review, that is like the, the what is that third rail? That, that is kryptonite. People are not going to go near that. They do not want to hear about post tenure review. But if you want to talk about changing law schools and changing curriculum, you're going to talk about post tenure review. That's fascinating. I, you know, I've never been a professor. And so it, it makes a lot of sense to me that that would sort of be those recommendations that are coming forward. So thank you so much for that. Um, how do faculty include these kind of difficult conversations in a remote learning environment where teaching may be primarily happening on Zoom and it's already difficult to get to that level of personal engagement? Let me speak quickly to that because I just read my student evaluations from last year, which was uh, mostly on Zoom, and I was fascinated to, 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 to hear from them what worked and what didn't work. And what I think really, they were the best best feedback I've ever gotten in 17 years of teaching. And I think I figured out why, partly anyways, which is that I started each Zoom class with a reaching out of them as people. And I didn't keep going back like, oh, this is so hard. Oh, we're in a pandemic. This is like, it's so terrible. I didn't start there, but I started as a, how you doing? What could we do to support you? What could we could do to make this better? What could make you know your learning better? Let's talk about what's happening. Let's talk about what I mean, it was much more personal than um, in a Zoom room than it was in the classroom because the classroom I had been for seventeen years I think more arm's length like you know I'm up in the front of the classroom let's get to let's get to what we're talking about today and I I've, I've let that barrier down a little bit more during the Zoom in part because I really felt like the students, these were two L and three L's as well, as well as my first years, really needed that space, needed that space to communicate and connect in a way that they, they, they couldn't do unless we were, I was intentionally starting those conversations. So I'll, I'll start the conversation off with that. And I think the Zoom actually is more engaging for students. I don't know why, but they love that chat feature. <laughs> Just typing in everything. So those thoughts were coming faster than I could deal with them. So I think that using the technology and having the Zoom was actually a better opportunity. And so I took advantage. Now I had the I had the advantage of having done this already. So it wasn't something that was new to me. So I don't think it's fair for me to expect everybody else to have done it. Um, but for me, it was actually easier because I already had them engaged. I had them in a higher engagement because I think the technology based teaching was something they were more accustomed to and, and liked. Um, and so I took advantage of that and we could I could easily bring in my YouTube video or my video or something like that that made that required less work of me than it would have done if I was in the classroom because I'm a little technology challenged. Um, so for me, I think it made it a, a lot more accessible to be able to engage in that work. 
I mean, that's one of the things I'm hoping that that you know we're all across our institutions doing is thinking about um, what what was what was that useful learning that came from this um, totally undesirable uh, pivot to uh, to online learning. And I will say um, for myself that that there were lots of opportunities to connect in ways that. Um, that we never connect with. I mean, I was in students' homes. They were in my home. Um, you know, I think that um, talking talking to uh, uh, Professor Ruan's point about um, being at arm's length. You know, we're we're all we're all busy in in our in our respective spaces in law school. We're moving in between classes. We're focused on our scholarship. We've got this committee meeting, and now I'm teaching. I'm teeing up papers. I'm conferencing, and there was a sense that um, that that when we were staring at one another across these, this bizarre portal, that there was a moment that we were just with one another. Um, one of the things that I did from right from, right from the beginning when we went um, emergency online is I had a standing 9 a.m., 9 to 10 a.m. Um, coffee hour. I told my students, I'm gonna be on Zoom with my cup of coffee, come as you are. Um, if I'm here by myself, I'm gonna drink my coffee. If you come to, to sit with me, um, that's wonderful. And I had some, some consistent takers who it just helped them get up every day. Um, and through those experiences, I learned so much about them. And I think that we have to find those ways to build community um, back in law school. I felt that experience as when I was a, a law student, when I was in clinic, that sense of sort of, of shared mission and community. And I think we're missing that from um, our general general law school um, experience, particularly in the one year, again, because we're, we're forcing students to compete with one another um, for small pieces of the pie. You actually brought up something I just remembered. During the pandemic year, I had more office hours visit than I've had in all the years I had of teaching. So people were more engaged in the office. I mean, every single office hour day, I had somebody in there. And that, that had never happened to me before. That's so interesting because I, I started in the class of 2020. So I started online and I, I took most of my 1L classes online and I sort of experienced that similar thing that there was a sense of heightened engagement. So especially going to your point, Professor Tate, about the chat feature being so well utilized, um, that seems like a perfect example of a feature that diverse or first generation students will do because they feel more comfortable in that format. So how, when classes hopefully at some point return to something that is more normal, how can that still be incorporated in that live environment? You got me on that one. <laughs> I wish, I, I, I hope there is a way to try to figure that out. If somebody figures it out, please let me know because I did enjoy that extra engagement. Um, but without the same, with, but without students just spurting out in class, because I did have to kind of manage that a little bit better when we started coming back into class. You can't just start talking out in class. You got to actually wait <laughs> for me to call on you. Right. So bringing back the social norms of the classroom had to be reminded, right? Like actually we have to raise our hand because we don't want to talk over one another. But I, I tried to answer this a little in the, bit in the q and I actually fell really flat um, at the beginning of this semester when I tried to incorporate some of that by just asking general questions that worked on Zoom that didn't work in person. How's everybody doing? Let's do a check-in. Anybody want to, anyone want to speak up? People just looked at like, no, I'm not going to speak up in the middle of this classroom. I'm not on Zoom right now. So I think um, I realized I have to be a little more specific. Like, hey, can someone tell us a little bit about what, well, you know, what they did this weekend that really helped, you know, get the stress out, you know, that maybe we can learn from. Then people talk about, you know, a dog park thing that they did or something like that. And it's just a couple of minutes. And I used to be really against these types of things. I used to be like, no, I am hardcore law professor. I got to get to the law. I got to get to what I'm teaching. But I think just taking a couple minutes to sort of humanize and talk about, you know, the, the fact that this is challenging times. Let's talk about something that happened. And I just read this in the newspaper that really affected me. Did it affect you? Right. And talk about that just for a few minutes. I think might get might get a little bit to this. I'll just follow on. I mean, I do think um, there are technologies, obviously, that are available. I, I use word clouds in my classroom as a way to try to get um, individual individuals talking about various things and getting um, and getting feedback. But I also just want to highlight that you know what Professor Ron just noted that that sense of like coming in as a hardcore professor. Um, Particularly as as female professors, um, it, it we, we're running a we're, we're always sort of um, trying to toggle between. Um, am I going to be taken seriously if I'm if I'm too if I'm too nice? Am I soft? Am I am I too motherly? Am I too this? Am I too that? Um, and so part of it is actually I think. Um, uh, also asking the students to um, 
to, to support and build the law schools that they want to see. So if you want nicer, kinder professors who um, care about what you're doing um, in your individual lives and um, check in with you to see if you actually went on that run that you said you were going to um, go on, uh, then, then it also has to, has to be the thing that you value in your evaluations and you have to actually um, uh, uh, continue to, to engage with them as the, the, the people with expertise um, that they have. So a combination of, um, there's still a lot of good technology that we can, can utilize, I think, in this space to get um, students thinking. One of the, the other thing that I do is I still use my discussion thread on Canvas as a way to center conversations, especially if we're going to, to uh, for example, if we read something um, and I want to just bring people's sort of attention um, and, their, and their thinking voices to the topic before, um, they, before I see hands. And I'll ask students to use that um, discussion thread um, as a as a couple minute um, prompt in the beginning of class as we as we settle in and I've found that to be useful as well. That's fantastic. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this is about uh, the scholarship that all of you have been participating in. The majority of panelists that are presenting at this entire symposium identify as female. Is this true across this kind of scholarship and conversation? And if so, why do you think that's the case? We all smiled and didn't say anything. <laughs> I, I go to a lot of these conferences, a lot of these symposia, and there's a lot of women in the room. Um, and I, I, I think that, and if you're a man in this space, I think you're like, oh, the man in the space. So um, I'll just, as a reflection, that um, I think that there are a lot of female voices, which I appreciate, but I also think we need to be um, inviting and and try and get um, try and get a, a broader diversity in terms of gender in this space as well. I think it's also true because we have the inequalities that females across the races feel. So there is some familiarity with, you know, having those um, biases held against you. And so it's easier to cross over into this, into this work. Whereas with the men, particularly white men, they're probably uncomfortable with the topic because they've never had to feel the way we feel in those spaces. So it may be that it's just harder for them to identify and harder for them to find their voice in this work. We do have a few, but like you mentioned, they're the exception. And I would add, you know, I think that this also goes to, you know, who has, um, who have law schools benefited historically? Who has this, who has the system that we've had for a hundred years worked for and who has it not? So for me, it's not surprising that the voices who are saying we need reform um, are the, are the voices that had said that, that this wasn't working for them either. And that they want to be part of, um, of something new and better uh, and, and future proof um, uh, what we're, what we're currently doing. Thank you so much for all of those answers. I think you're all completely spot on. And thank you so much for participating in this panel on the 1L curriculum. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for participating today.